Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's Terrell Shaheed out of Austin, Texas, with the Blue Vinyl Crates, Neckbone. And uh, so when you're in Austin, look for us. Time, place. Are you good in your space? Who would have thought it would be? At this club, he would bring it to me. Bill comes in dainty features Well, I don't care I hold her to the same standards Equal, just to be fair What's up? Yo, we in the ATX, baby Uh, yo, King T Shahi, baby Uh, King T So tell me some about Mr. Terrell The musician The musician, you know Hey, I got bit by the bug. I'm a, I'm a classically trained uh, saxophonist. I was on tenor originally by, you know, by trade. And so that means we used to have programs where you start in sixth grade. And so I, I, I you know, you find your horn, your instrument, mm -hmm. sixth grade. And, you know, once I picked up the instrument, I felt like this is it. I mean, you know, yeah. I can do this all the time and continue to learn more and more about mastering this, this thing. But I got into that and I started playing real early, 15 years old. I was playing professionally on the, on the street in 6th Street. But anyway, that, that kind of made me move on to uh, meeting some people that were kind of heavy in the business. And the, the band was called The Business that was on 6th Street. So I met a lot of people that were from that group. And from there, I think I just kind of saw all these different bands and just got really involved in seeing that you could make money here in Austin at that time playing in one band. Wow. You had all these venues. Yeah. I mean, a lot of venues. <laughs> the thing you see now is not, that's not the way it was. You, you didn't go book your own shows. You didn't go do all that. You had agents. You had an agency that made sure that everybody got the right money and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So that's kind of a different world. It's so it's gotten harder. It's harder for to them. To make a living. Right. Right. Now, right. explain, and because they don't have agents looking out for them, so they make- They're trying to make their own deals. They're not business people at all. Most, okay. of, most of these, people don't really understand that this person is working like day and night. It gets to be a heavy grind. And, and also people that have not learned the industry, the young people that don't want to listen to the older people, that have to learn the hard way and go through the doors we've already walked through, we told you it was in there. But anyway, when you go do that, <laughs> it's depressing because you get hit with stuff that you didn't want to believe. You thought that wasn't it. Maybe you thought I was exaggerating. Maybe you thought I was stuttering. But when you go in there, <laughs> you're gonna see exactly what we said was in there. And it's not what you want to hear at all. It's not, it's not at all what you think the dream or whatever you thought that was, that's not what's back there. So we get a lot of depression. We got a lot of suicide happening now. We got a lot of heavy drinking. We got a lot of heavy doping pill popping, you know, it, it, it's, and some of them are doing it for different reasons, because some people are doing it with the cope, some people think it's going to make them creative. Just think about it, and you're not going to all of a sudden get there, so you're going to have to, like, it's a 10-year grind for most people to see anything that's really, you know, doing something, and it looks like all of a sudden it just, ah, it just blew up or whatever, but mm -mm, it's been, it's been working for a long, long time. I mean, if we don't take the time to really digest truth, I think it, it worsens the situation. This over-the-top optimism is making people crazy because bad stuff is gonna happen tomorrow. It's gonna happen the day after. I don't care how optimistic, you can turn a cartwheel and say whatever you wanna say over and over. I'd prefer to just give you a true understanding of, but this is gonna happen tomorrow. So you may as well, what's better, hoping it doesn't or being prepared to handle it fully? And that is an exercise of your mind. You're gonna have to get tougher up here. And getting tougher up here is not what they're teaching right now. We have to, if we're gonna stay alive as Austin, like we're at all, cause we've already lost Austin from according to what the old school guys, what we know, that's no longer in existence. Mm -hmm. But if we're gonna keep the remnants of it, they'll, they'll have to fight for it. You know, it's gonna be a... What, what does that fight look like? It looks like politics, which is something we hate doing as artists. Mm -hmm. 
we'll do a lot of stuff. We'll show up to a lot of stuff. But are we going to show up to City Hall in Austin, Texas, down 2nd Street and go in there and, you know, look what's going on in the dockets and make sure that we're being included when they're building 37 towers. So some historic venues are being closed, even downtown. It's been yeah, going. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, we've lost every major church. A lot of you won't remember Liberty Lunch. This is way before a lot of people's time. But we've got Liberty Lunch. We've got Emos that's been moved around everywhere. We lost La Zona Rosa, Austin Music Hall. Um, <laughs> And the list goes on. I mean, pretty much these are major. What's, uh, what's coming in its place? Is it just there like is none. Old it's just like a closed up they're shutting, building? Yeah, or they're shutting. Like yeah, they're demolished mm -mm. and something else is built. Something else comes in that's not the same business. That is bad for the mental health of the, the musician. I saw a guy with a production company move here from California with a whole studio. And it was at the lowest point, I think, for Austin. It was kind of before we turned into these new venues started coming in. And he was crying. He's like, I packed up my, I was on the commission at that time, I'll, I'll never forget it, he had packed up everything, moved his business here based on the way that we were advertising outside of Austin. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you go to Costa Rica, you can go anywhere. They don't just advertise coming to America. <laughs> they specifically advertise a lot of Austin stuff across the world, and they, and they say live music capital, live music, they drive it in. Okay, so in my opinion, this is false advertisement. I'm actually very shocked that they have not been sued for it by now because I thought something like that with this guy moving his business based on what people are saying and the projections of 20 years ago. The younger generation, they're crazy talented sometimes. I mean, can play. I mean, and it's amazing because they're, they're still learning to play at that level. It's not like gone just because electronics are here. So they're playing, but um, we, you know, they, we need to go learn about this other stuff. Um, it, it's gonna save them time, it will make them money. You know, they actually may have enough songs out there early enough to make money, you know, and those get checked from the mailbox, you know, <laughs> do whatever they want. So licensing so. royalties, mm -hmm. publishing. Publishing, that's it. I would say something that's not as popular these days, you know, and I have this conversation with lots of people behind the scenes. So I am a student of the scriptures and I would turn people to look to Jesus Christ teachings is what I would tell you to do. Read a little while, just read a little while about the world. He saw the world the same way you see the world. So, you know, you're not the first or the last to, to find the truth of the hardships of, of the world. Hey, what's happening? I'm D Madness. And uh, I uh, play in the band called Terrell and the Blue Vinyls. And I also play with band D Madness Project, which happens to be my project. If you Google D-Manage, you can find all kinds of stuff on YouTube. All right, I'm here with the legend, D-Madness. AKA Lorenzo Wayne Jackson. Jackson. Got it. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for meeting with me and uh, taking time out of your day. I know from all the different musicians and artists we've been talking about, you are the legend. You're the one. You're where a lot of their stories start with as far as music in Austin. So can you kind of take us back down memory lane and tell us a little bit about your story and your journey? Well, I mean, I, I came here in Austin when I was eight years old. I went to school for the blind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I already knew how to play. I started drums when I was three, actually. Wow. Started playing drums when I was three years old. My dad was a drummer too, so. Because yeah. when I found out I was blind, I didn't know exactly what to do with that. I didn't know what that, that was. I was normal. I was, uh, I wasn't like everybody else, you know. I mean, as a kid, you know, you don't really, you don't really get used to that yet. 
takes a little while to get used to the fact that you're a little different. Yeah. But then my dad came home with this record from the record store and he played it and it was Stevie Wonder. So after the song finished, he said, by the way, he's blind. He did all that by himself. Wow. And after that, that's when I started playing drums and then, you know, I got to school for the blind. I mean, you know, because that's all like newest drums until like, of course, my mom in between time like bought me guitars and stuff. But mm -hmm. Wasn't really learning that particular thing yet. I'm still trying to learn the drums, but I did kind of pick up on how to play a couple of chords here and there. Just, I mean, I'm pretty much self-taught. Mm -hmm. I think that once I, my dad told me that I exploded. You know? mm -hmm. like, if he can do this, then hey, I can do this. I can make this work for me. Playing music could work for me. So I started doing that. And uh, so drums was my first instrument, then violin. Mm -hmm. And then actually I learned, I started playing bass guitar actually in 1982, Halloween. <laughs> I spent my whole life pretty much hanging out with people that were older than me. And that's why, you know, I learned a lot doing that. And and actually when all of when all of the people you know graduated, all my high school friends graduated, I started I won I winded up actually becoming the keyboard player and the bass player. You know, I'd have the bass in one hand like this and the keyboard yeah. in my other hand. Wow. Then I started learning how to play the drums and the bass at the same time too. So that's where D Madness came from. Okay. Because I started a project called D Madness and I was playing keys with my right hand. I had the keys to my right and I had the bass in my lap in my left hand and I had a kick and hi hat like this in front wow. of me and a snare and a microphone. That's where D Madness, that name came from. Because you're like a one man band. Right. <laughs> that is mad. Yeah. Basically, the only way that you can really pull off being a full-time musician here in Austin is that you have to learn, you have to learn how to play multiple instruments and different genres of music. If you if you only play one instrument and one genre of music, you pretty much just better get a day job. Okay. That's, so ever since I started doing it, 1988, I've been doing it and it hasn't stopped yet. Wow. And I'm always coming up with other concepts mm -hmm. to uh, enhance the project. Did you do any like extracurricular activities outside of music or was music your whole life? And it's always been your life. I know it's like. Well, I uh, I did some wrestling. Some wrestling? Wrestling in school. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, as a person who was blind, I had this thing in my head that, you know, whatever every, whatever every visual person can do, I can do it too. So I, I would just try to, I experimented. I taught myself how to ride a bicycle. Wow. And I, I, you know, I fell like nine times, but <laughs> until I learned about, but I never gave up, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I can swim too. Wow. And I think all these extra activities helped me in my music too. Yeah. Did it give you more confidence? Did you say that you ice skated too? Or am I crazy? No, I, I, I taught myself how to ice skate. They used to take us to the ice skating rinks. Wow. And. Uh, and uh, I was get actually pretty good at it. Wow. When I was always told, you can't do this because you can't see, I was stuttering. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. What are any other times that you may have um, felt any adversity in life, uh, any challenges, anybody say no when they should have said yes and then you proved them wrong? Or well, that, that, that kind of goes 
with hanging out with visual people who can see, you know, who can mm -hmm. see with their eyes, mm -hmm. there are times when I have suggested to them not to go to this certain place. I mean, when somebody tells me to look out for, a, you know, for a tree, I'm gonna, you know, listen to them. But that doesn't mean that a blind person can't tell a sighted person mm -hmm. this is not a good idea. I mean, I think that sometimes, sometimes they should listen. Mm -hmm. Because you feel like you have a heightened sense of, uh, like your other senses are, are more sensitive? Yeah, and the, and the gut instinct is, you mm -hmm. know. And the last time I didn't listen to my gut instinct, you know, gets me in trouble when I don't listen to it. I mean, right. It's only been once or twice since I haven't listened to it, but. See, the thing is that with, with people that can see, they don't, when they're having a conversation with somebody and someone's saying something, mm -hmm. for, even if you're talking about just, if you're talking about business or anything like that. Right. They're looking in their faces and they're going, I think this person is telling the truth, but I'm just like, I'm listening to their tone. Mm -hmm. Tone tells me everything. I don't, give, I don't care what you're looking at. Yeah. Because anybody can have a straight face and say whatever the hell they want to. Sure. And like when I do business, I don't want to do the email and texting thing. I want to hear your voice first so I can find out if you're full of it. Yeah. Or if you're trying to pull something over me. I don't, I don't do that type of thing. And once I trust a person, then after that, yeah, I'll do the texting and email thing after that. Once I've had a con you know, conversation with you, mm -hmm. like, listen to you talk or phrases or how right. you phrase everything because it's, it's all going to matter it's all going to matter it's all in the phrasing the pauses if you take too long then you, you're trying to figure out what to say <laughs> and that bothers me yeah i don't know i mean music i mean it is my mental everything i mean without it i don't know the music is like my antidote yeah Keeps you feeling alive. Keeps me feeling like I can do just about anything. Well, if I didn't have it, I don't know how my mental health would be. Mm -hmm. This is D-Madness and Stevie. Yeah. This is D-Madness and Stevie. We are bringing joy to your Full band. Full band. How many people were on the stage? 
think we had nine. Nine. Yeah, yeah you mentioned Obeo afterwards <laughs> whenever we got to chat for a little bit, and he's really good. Oh, he's phenomenal. He's really good. Yeah, he, he writes, watch out for he him. He writes his songs. Mm-hmm, he writes everything. From Houston, wow. Well, thanks for, <laughs> you know, we're trying to grab you in here real quick. I know some other people are coming in here after us, but um, can you kind of like just touch on, you know, your story, your journey, how you ended up in Austin, and how, you know, you've been able to kind of, you know, work through different low points or in your career, in yeah. life? Um, yeah, Definitely. Um, I was raised in Houston, and then I came to Austin maybe 12 years ago and just uh, made some great friends and relationships. Um, and then anytime I really had any problems, which does happen to all of us, right? Especially as a live musician, um, dealing with the, the city changing and whatnot. Um, I always had really supportive people around me, so I would go out and uh, support my friends in, in their endeavors, and then yeah. it would come back and help me feel better about the things I was doing and come through those those periods, for sure. Um, and I think going out and being active is the best thing to do when you're having those, those issues, because everyone else is having issues, too. So, so I give back, so just go mm -hmm. and help and do yeah. what you can. Well, that was my motto, definitely, is to get out I and see that. my friends and be, realize that you're surrounded by great people. Absolutely. I actually just recorded a song called Reflection, and it's that. It's uh, don't get too stressed out about these things that are minor, because in the big picture you have family and you have exactly. a place to sleep. Like, exactly. you know, so right. that's, I think it's a big topic for me right now is Absolutely. reflect and be grateful. It's kind of like gratitude. Mm -hmm. It's kind of yeah. like living in, like, the moment and just being grateful for the things that are going right. Yeah, especially as yeah. a musician, I'm blessed to be able to be fascinated and that's my, that's what I get to do. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, when you came to Austin, do you feel like you, like you're home here? I know you've been here for 10 years and, and you're from Houston. Uh, like... What does Austin mean to you? I know you said it's changing. Yeah, um, so I was raised in Houston and that's what I know, but I think also, uh, this is, this, we're still in Texas. We're still, yeah, you know, we're still exactly close to home. That. So it's kind of, it's the same type of people, uh, but I think the Austin culture is the best for me as a musician, um, as a natural, like just being out in nature and mm -hmm. yeah, the, the vibe of the people here is open. Kind of like good for your mental health, huh? Mm -hmm. So, was there a time or a point in your music career so far? Um, I mean, where you just kind of felt like this is getting a little too hard? Definitely. Yeah, there was a point where I had um, a, a band going that I just kept around, didn't really feel comfortable with, and had to kind of end it. And it was like a relationship thing, you know? Yeah. It was really hard to do. And then once I did it, I've been so happy. And now the band I have now is completely different, and it's what I want to do, and it's just being myself. Mm -hmm. um, now we have a big horn section, and so I have to play with some of the best horn players in town, and it's big and soul, really and it's fun. Yeah. So it's exactly what I wanted to do. So that's one of my points is like, just do what you want to do and just do it today, do it now. Absolutely. If you've got something going on, just stop that and, you know, quit those old habits. So, like, don't be afraid to... Like, to go for it, yeah. To go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel better now about being true to myself about it, yeah. That's a wonderful message. So do you just feel more confident and overall, like, a better leader? Just all that musician. Definitely. Yeah, I think that was that was a big thing. Is the the band itself was had some issues, and we were able to really kind of fight, you know, get through that, yeah. and um, realize that it was going to be better the way it is now. Yeah, luck is opportunity meets preparedness. So just be prepared and do your work and get tight, and then when the opportunity comes along, you're ready for it, then you then you get lucky. That's good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Um, what would you say to someone who's maybe dealing with some maybe feeling like oh well I can or I have I'm on the spectrum, I have autism, or I deal with, you know, social <laughs> and you're anxiety. you're killing it right now, because I have a song too called Charlie, mm -hmm. and it's about a toddler that lived next door to me a while ago, and he was, I think he was on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, this is a going to be a tough kid's life, it's going to be tough for his parents, and then I stopped myself, because like, people that do great things in the world are sometimes a little different, and sometimes they're genius, and so I wrote a song called Charlie, and it's about that, like about his life. So the story goes of the boy next door Different and not his parents' choice. He'd rather be all playing the Lord. Put him with the other kids and he won't say long. Sarah Charlie is what he's for. Could go and how great it. Who, who knows? I can't judge, and so mm -hmm. don't judge that quick. Exactly. And if you're a little different, then that's sometimes okay. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it's what makes you, gives you that spark or flair that you never know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Exactly. That's good stuff. I have a lot of opportunities that I, that come to me that 
I don't know that I deserve really, but if you just say yes and go find them and just try things, uh, a lot of times you can get blessed with some things that you, you you wouldn't have unless you put yourself out there a little bit, yeah. So like, step outside the comfort yeah, zone? Yeah, meet people that you don't know, go to different cities you've never been to, and sometimes you meet some beautiful people. Okay, wonderful things come out of being adventurous. Exactly. And like, letting go of the fear. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the not known, like where the anxiety lays, right. right? That yeah. fear, right? So just kind of like knowing, okay, I understand why I'm feeling this way. However, we're still gonna go do it, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Exactly. And it's a big world out there. It is. Yeah. <laughs> a lot to be like discovered. Mm hmm Hi, my name is Dan Redman, and today we're here at Mosaic Sound Collective. We are a music hub that is located in East Austin in a 25,000 square foot former juvenile detention facility. We are a one-stop shop of resources and services for the creative sector focused, in, focused on education, advocacy, community outreach, and our resources and services provide a one-stop shop of everything a musician or artist would need to thrive in their industry. Well, I guess the, the journey really started. I have two children that are, um, well, boy, I, men, 19 and 21 years old now. And they are aspiring musicians that uh, started playing music when they were very young. And I was a musician that played a little bit of everything. I was a jack of all trades, master of none, DJed, but I had all the equipment at my house. And so soon, soon thereafter, when they became better than I was, I just became the encouraging father. Mm -hmm. But uh, we lived in Austin, Texas here, and you know their peer group was not other kid bands, but it was adult bands that when I moved here in 1992. Like professional musicians were profession their buddies. Yeah, that were all. They were like being mentored. Uh, Absolutely, you know, some were their teachers, and you know they started as a band called Residual Kid when they were nine and eleven. Wow. And then they were signed to Warner Brothers by Seymour Stein, who founded. Wow. Sire Records, when they were 14 and 16, discovered it South by Southwest. The dream come true. That is impressive. And it's, it, it was something, but what I started to see was that musicians and artists living in a city like Austin, which has this moniker of the live music capital of the world, right. didn't really have the support structure to really help musicians and artists. So a lot of musicians and artists were working in the service industry, whether it yeah. be in a bar or a restaurant or a music venue. So they're not really getting to really hone their craft, learn the business right. side of things and really figure out how to make a living being an artist. Unless they could tour, you know, and so if you want to tour, you have to have the flexibility, which means you're working in, in the service industry where you can leave and come back to it. Mm -hmm. My original goal was to create a sustainable nonprofit model, mm -hmm. something that, you know, Austin has one of the highest concentrations of nonprofits in the country, and they're always in fundraising mode. And um, when I set out to create the business model for Mosaic, I did it as a combination of tenants, um, uh, revenue streams that we own, and then community outreach. So we have about 20 different tenants here at Mosaic, and they help to pay for the mortgage. And then we have revenue streams that we own, which include a couple of uh, performance spaces, rehearsal studio space, um, screen printing facilities, the education, and things like that. So that helps There's us to so be... There's so many things going on here. You know, and I was told a lot, you know, by consultants and accountants and lawyers that you can't do that, you can't do that. And I kept asking <laughs> why. And they said, well, you're creating a hybrid nonprofit and for profit, and you can't do that. And I said, uh, You legally can. Yeah, well, you legally can. And, and so we've developed that. And I used a couple of examples of, you know, mega churches and mm -hmm. you know the NRA and exactly. I don't want to get political or anything like that but <laughs> you know it's there are a lot of examples of organizations and here we are musicians are their own small businesses and you know you can't blame an artist because they put all their eggs in the basket and went to school to hone that art, you know, exactly. and, and um, they may have gone to a music school because yeah. their dream was to get signed to a label and to become, yeah. you know, to become, become huge and follow their dream. Well, when that bubble burst and labels disappeared or the power of labels disappeared, um, what are you left with? Everything we've done in here has been, 
I mean, it's truly, we are a DIY model. I mean, it's ground up. from the ground up and, and everything we've done has been DIY. And so- It's really from the heart. It's well, like, it, it, it's all authentic work. Well, I just don't want Austin to turn into another big city. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that we're- And then let's happen. talk about the side of town that this is on. That's important too, because you're serving the, uh, the population that is getting pushed out. That's right. You know, and, and they're, you're accessible to them, you know, and uh, you welcome them in. And that's not a, a trendy thing. That's something that you've been doing. This isn't a, oh yeah, I all of a sudden support black people. This is what you do. That's well, just who you are. There is a real push in the creative sector for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And every business should be focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, and, you know, being in East Austin where, you know, the land was affordable five years ago. You know, now we have big companies coming in and, you know, and, and so, I mean, Austin is one of the only cities in the country with a dwindling African-American population. You know, we have some real serious players and some real serious history. Yeah, you know? they've been pushed out east, yeah. like Maynard or- Lockhart um, or Lockhart. Elgin. I believe that instead of just knocking down and rebuilding, we should be repurposing where we can. And so this 50 year old former juvenile detention facility, yeah. which has- It, it kind of, you know, it keeps the spirit of Austin alive. In the creative sector, we have to find a way to monetize. We have to make a, find a way to export this rich history that we have. I hope we can uh, change it. And I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having the discussion with me. Of course. Hi, I'm Mac Frolick. Uh, I play in Mother Falcon, uh, Slow Burst, is my new project, and every Saturday night at Sahara Lounge. Well, I guess every Saturday night, they have a night called Africa Night, and it's basically uh, a full night of like Afro, jazz, reggae, blues, funky, fusion, dance music. It's one of the last like Austin neighborhood bars. Like it's literally in a neighborhood on the east side. Basically, as a person, I was in this quest for authenticity and genuine inspiration and genuine, um, I don't know, music even. And Sahara Lounge in Africa Night became for me like a, a way to connect back to what I fe feel is like the beginning of music. This idea of um, seeing the correlation, I guess, not just with music, but just creativity and being um, susceptible maybe to different forms of mental illness, maybe, or whatever. Because, you know, creatives feel so hard. They're very emotional. They're very sympathetic. They've been through a lot, so they have sim sympathy for a lot of situations. And when you're open and vulnerable like that, you're susceptible to feeling not just your pain, but other people's pain. Personally, I've been through um, several episodes of like depression and anxiety, some that last like three, four months. Um, and those are always like growth um, journeys, I guess, but they usually, and you know, everyone feels this. First you think, oh, I'm just kind of down. And then when it, after a couple weeks, you start to realize okay, something else is going on. And for me, it took a lot 
for me to decide to even contact a psychiatrist and seek that kind of help because for a while I just thought I'm just not trying hard enough like I'm not caring about myself enough this is just a phase or this is just a you know whatever and uh, all I have to do is try a little harder and be logical about it and I'll be fine. My episodes are usually triggered by some kind of traumatic event where I have to reevaluate who I am and what my purpose is. And, and so um, one major thing that helped me was I had a dog and he was the only reason sometimes I would go outside because he needed to do his business or, you know, I knew the walk would be good for me just as much as him. And um, yeah, and, and you know, it's not, it's the truth where when you come home to a dog, they really are, they're just all smiles and like unconditionally. Yes, and even like at night when you're sleeping and you look over and your dog's next to your leg and for one minute you can at least be grateful for something. Um, and that's kind of also what I did was I kind of trained myself to be more positive to kind of see what things I could be thankful for and um, and kind of rewire my brain. Even though I was taking medication, you know, to kind of balance myself out, I knew I still had to do my own work. And I did like mindfulness meditation and other forms of like awareness and also other forms of acceptance of like, not just physically where I'm at, but um, to realize a lot of the things that I was afraid of were only in my head. Yeah, don't be afraid to disconnect. Like, it's okay to disconnect from the scene, from social media, um, from your even some friends that aren't like as important to you. It's okay to say, I'm not, I'm gonna stay in. Um, know your support system. Um, family members are there to, they love you and care for you. And um, even though it's hard to reach out, they're there for you. So um, a support system is very important. Music was a great way for me to not only explore who I was without words, um, but to um, give me a platform to not be afraid, I guess, of, um, of my emotions and of my feelings and realize that music for me was a way to channel what I was processing. I guess a word of advice that I would give to any, any teenager that is really creative but going through a lot, um, to one, just keep going. Um, it only gets better and trust the good version of you. Um, you know, um, you've gotta be on your own team, you know? And um, if you were in optimistic mood, how would you feel about it? Just even start playing games with yourself as far as trying to rework your mindset to be positive um, rather than negative, to see the good rather than the bad right away. And then maybe one morning you'll wake up and you actually will be excited again. to the radio information this leads me can't seem to grab a home live and die for the ghetto gotta let my people go police killed a brother yesterday i guess life still goes on anger dwells inside me looking for the answer to freedom everybody get to fight the war and nobody knows the reason so play on Till the morning comes Send a train to the DJ And maybe he'll play my song I gotta get away Gotta release my mind Break off some sticky Put it in a line Lay it on the plate Roll it up inside Thick bit is lighter I guess high And I stay high I stay high Most of y'all live like you sure to die I guess it's cause you don't believe in the afterlife 
slave to American dreams Cut the pie, but the slice ain't never the same For you and I, I see you worshiping a paper god Spending no time with your child, every day is a job You ain't living, and every day they killing you soft But you happy, plus you still afraid of the cross You have to bear, scared that the devil will stop and stare Probably cut you off from your family affairs This world is sick, no doubt to stay ahead of the game I'm doing this for other people, not for glory and fame